Welcome in to 100 Second Haunts. I'm Mark, and today we have a true crime video for you. I'm going to be making the case why Johnny Roselli is the absolutely most colorful, fascinating, interesting gangster ever of the American Mafia. The amount of people that Johnny Roselli interacted with throughout his criminal career is actually staggering. The list is an absolute who's who of anyone throughout the 20th century. It goes from the chairman of the mob, Lucky Luciano, to the mob's accountant, Meyer Lansky, to Los Angeles legend, Las Vegas legend, Tony Canero, Scarface Al Capone, Los Angeles boss, Drac Jagna, um, Paul Rica, Benny Siegel, Tony Accardo, Mickey Cohen, Sam Giancana, studio boss for Columbia Pictures, Harry Cohn, Murray the Camel Humphreys, Abner Longies Wilman, Frank DeSimone, actors Mark Lawrence, Gene Harlow, George Raft, Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Mo Daylitz, Frank Costello, the Prime Minister of the Mob, to Santo Traficante Jr., Louis Little New York Campania, Felix Milwaukee Phil, Aldericio, Frank the Enforcer Nitty, to President John F. Kennedy and his dad, Papa Joe Kennedy. Everyone who loves the mob genre has had to ask themselves over the years, who would I say is my favorite gangster ever? It's definitely an extremely difficult question to answer. With so many decades and so many families to choose from in the American Mafia, I don't know who's yours, but one gangster who always was high on my list was Johnny Roselli. While he's not my favorite, no one is, it's, it's too hard of a question to answer, I would argue he might be the most interesting and fascinating gangster ever in the American Mafia. To anyone who would listen, Johnny Roselli would say he was born in Boston, but he was actually born in Italy on July 4th, 1905. His parents, Vincenzo and Maria, named him Filippo. His birth name was Filippo Sacco. At six years old, Filippo and his mother, Maria, board a ship and four months later arrive in New York. They head straight to Grand Central Station and board a train to Boston. Vincenzo worked in a shoe factory and eventually got them out of the ghetto. But in 1918, a little thing called the Spanish flu was making its way around the world, eventually killing Vincenzo Sacco and 50 million other people. A 13-year-old Filippo Sacco hits the streets, leaving Boston after a small narcotics arrest, hitchhiking his way to Southern California, just in time for a little event known as Prohibition. He started to call himself Johnny Roselli. During the 20s in Los Angeles, the premier underworld organization was known as the City Hall Gang or the Combination. The leaders of the Combination were Guy McAfee, Milton Page, and Albert Marco. They were all in bed with LA Mayor Frank Shaw and his bagman brother, Joe Shaw. Any and all vices in LA during the 20s were being dominated by the City Hall gang. Towards the end of the 20s in LA, the mayor decides not to run for a fourth term. The other heads of the City Hall gang beg and plead for him to stay in as mayor, but nobody can convince him to stay on. And at this time, Johnny had been working for Tony Carnero, who himself was a legend and total force of nature in Los Angeles. So Johnny is moving up the ranks in Carnero's organization. And in 1927, Johnny takes a trip to Chicago for a huge prize fight between Jack Dempsey and Gene Tooney. And for a brief moment, a young Johnny Roselli meets Al Capone, known in the headlines as Scarface. A couple months later, he sees Al Capone again, but this time in L.A. at the Biltmore Hotel. And it's during this encounter, Capone comes to realize Johnny's very well connected in Los Angeles. So in the next year or two, Capone starts to invest in some things in L.A. and he personally sends for Johnny Roselli. Roselli is known more as a fixer and vice man than just some thug. And let's face it, Capone was smart. And he was said to really have an eye for criminal talent. Capone was the first guy to put political fixers around him. 
you know, three examples being the famous Gus Alex, Jake Gusick, and Murray Humphreys. Yes, he wanted killers and tough guys around him, but he also wanted people who could get things done on the political side and on the law side. So Roselli goes to Chicago to see Capone, and he introduces him to his inner circle and also to a man named Jack Dragna. There was a mafia in L.A., but they were more on the outskirts of the criminal underworld. So Capone's goal is for Jack Dragna and his crime family to take over L.A. So the City Hall gang was on their way out, and they didn't even know it. So at this time, Johnny Roselli becomes the go-between for Capone and Dragna. Johnny was a bit younger than Dragna, but Dragna always treated the gentleman gangster with respect. And in return, Roselli always treated Dragna with nothing but respect. And this was the start of a long relationship between the two men. So to take over L.A., they plan an extremely coordinated attack on all the brothels, speakeasies, bookie joints, gambling dens, I mean everything. And over a two-week period in the late 20s in L.A., Jack Dragna took over L.A. and let everyone know it was now him running the show. The new deal was they all worked for the L.A. crime family now. And 90% of the people, without batting an eye, said, yeah, okay. But some were going to put up a fight. And for those unlucky, unlucky people... Capone sent his cousin, Charles Fischetti, and a couple other outfit heavyweights to make an example out of them. And after a couple months, and with the backing of Capone, the Los Angeles crime family became the premier criminal organization in the underworld in L.A. So now they're organizing everything. And this is when they bring in the huge floating casinos off the coast of California. So three miles out, you're in international waters and not subject to local or federal laws. They started turning these yachts into massive gambling ships with first-class entertainment, dancing, gambling, prostitutes. (laughs) You could even deep-sea fish off the sides. These things were huge money makers for Los Angeles and Chicago. Law enforcement had no idea how to tackle this problem, and there was really nothing they could do. So now in 1931, Roselli gets a message from Capone stating he wants him to go to Nevada with Murray Humphreys. Roselli more or less saw Murray as an adversary. Roselli saw himself as a fixer, a strategist, and so was Murray the Camel. But when you're Johnny Roselli and Capone tells you to do something, you do it. So they went all through Nevada to all the state legislatures, basically buying votes to legalize gambling. And on March 19, 1931, the state legislature in Nevada passes the bill to legalize gambling. So now, towards the end of 1931, Capone goes away for tax evasion and names Frank Nitto, better known as Frank Nitty, as his successor. They called him the enforcer for his brutal enforcement of the rules. And early in his rule as boss, a friend comes to him and tells him this fucking punk named George Brown, is trying to extort him. Nitty has some of his goons grab Brown off the street and bring him to his house. And so they basically take him in the basement, scare the living shit out of him. And, you know, Nitty is enraged. Brown is trying to extort someone. It doesn't matter that it's his friend, but he's trying to extort someone in his city and not cut him in on the action. So Brown is terrified and starts trying to convince Nitty not to kill him, saying, hey, like, I'm not just some lowlife extortionist. I actually was a big deal at the IA. And this is what led to the Hollywood extortion of the movie industry. Nitty looks into Brown's claims and finds out George ran for president of the union the previous year and almost won. And Nitty says to Brown, I'm going to make you president. I'm going to show you how to extort on a national level. And now you work for me. So by this time, Roselli has been in L.A. for a little over a decade. He knows the lay of the land. He knows the players. He knows the turf. He's a young up-and-comer. He's connected. He's good-looking. You know, he's got some money in his pocket. And one of the people he becomes close with is Harry Cohn, the head of the studio for Columbia Pictures. To put it bluntly, 
Harry was a fucking dick. But it seems almost all studio bosses in Hollywood, especially back then, were complete assholes. But if the unions in Hollywood ever tried to strike, Harry calls Roselli. And it's at this time a young Roselli, you know, is picking up guys like an even younger Jimmy Fratiano to go bust heads at these union strikes. The largest union and most powerful in Hollywood was known as the IA, the International Alliance of Theater and Stage Employees. And this is the union that George Brown, with the full backing of the Chicago outfit, would become president of. So on June 4th, 1934, in Kansas City, the mob rigged the election so their man, George E. Brown, would become the president of Hollywood's most powerful union, the IA. Now, this day in Kansas City was absolutely bananas. Everyone from Lucky Luciano to Meyer Lansky and Benny Siegel were there and a ton of guys from the outfit. And acting as the floor manager was the head of Murder Incorporated himself, Lepke Buckalter. They were all there making sure everyone voted the way they were supposed to. Two of Brown's fellow extortionists, Willie Byoff and Nick Cercella, become his top advisors at the IA. Byoff, a former pimp, and Cercella, a gangster from Chicago, were both feared men in their own right. So Brown is kind of the front man, and Byoff is the power behind Brown, and the outfit is the power behind Byoff. So Cercella introduces Byoff to Roselli one day, and right away, Byoff realizes Roselli speaks for Chicago. And you know, Byoff does not like Roselli. He felt this whole thing was his scam originally, and now he had a fucking babysitter by the name of Johnny Roselli. Now, yes, the outfit put Brown and Byoff in power and made this extortion nationwide. But one thing that drove Byoff insane was that Nitty and the outfit are taking 70%. It didn't matter how big Byoff's take became, that number, 70%, kind of drove Byoff insane. And frankly, taking orders from and having to answer to Roselli also drove Byoff insane. But this extortion runs smooth for quite a while, and Byoff was demanding the studio heads pay him in cash in person. I mean, he loved nothing more than collecting this money in person from these big, powerful studio bosses. I mean, even as they paid him, Byoff was just as nasty as could be and just abusing everybody that came into contact with him. So now in 1938... Roselli meets a young actress named June Lang, and they have a hot and heavy romance, and Johnny actually marries her on April 1st, 1940, but by March of 42, they are divorced. Now, Byoff is so nasty and such a prick during these extortions, one of the studio heads complains to a federal investigator friend of his and starts to tell him how these guys, Brown and Byoff, came out of nowhere and took over everything. And how he has to pay a, quote unquote, no strike guarantee every month. And now this gets the investigator to start doing some digging. And in 1937, a federal investigation is opened against George Brown, Willie Byoff, and Nick Cercella. And on May 23rd, 1941, Brown, Byoff, and Cercella are indicted on racketeering and tax evasion. They take it to trial, and by the end of the year, Byoff gets 10 years, and Brown and Cercella get 8. Now, federal investigators are puzzled by how these lowlifes could have pulled off a crime of this scale with such organization. So they keep going to visit these three men in prison, and for the time being, no one is talking. But word gets back to Chicago that the feds keep going to visit these guys. So, to send a message to these three men on February 2nd, 1943, Estelle Carey, the mistress and main love of Nick Cercella, is brutally murdered. I mean, someone breaks in and they break her face and her teeth with a billy club. They stab her in the stomach and crotch and then they douse her in lighter fluid and set her on fire. Now, this brutal attack completely backfires, and now Byoff is enraged. His wife hears about this attack and goes into hiding, and after years of feeling underappreciated and 
taken advantage of by Chicago. After he goes to prison and keeps his mouth shut, they start killing their loved ones. And he says, enough is enough. So he calls the FBI and says, what do you want to know? Now, on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor is attacked by the Japanese, thus bringing the U.S. into World War II. Just weeks later, filled with emotion and a deep love for the U.S., a 36-year-old Roselli joins the army. Now, Roselli has had this lung issue that has plagued him his entire life, and for months on end, he'd have to check into this facility in Santa Barbara to try to heal his body. But nonetheless, he was accepted into the army and goes to basic training while living in the barracks. But Bioff's talking to the feds, and they indict Roselli, Nitty, Rika, and Campania for the Hollywood extortion. So George Brown and Willie Bioff were Nitty's guys as far as the outfit was concerned. Nitty needed to take the rap. At this time, this was the largest extortion case in the U.S. Nitty, not wanting to go back to prison, kills himself. Who knows what really happened there? I don't. But Roselli and the outfit guys plead not guilty and go to trial. On the first day of trial, Roselli shows up to court in his army uniform. The judge is like, you can't be serious. And he admits he doesn't want the jury to see him in his uniform because it will create a bias. The judge makes him change. They all get convicted and are all given 10-year sentences. Now, Rika is fucking furious. He felt it was his time to shine in Chicago, and now he's in fucking prison. They are all sent to the federal pen in Atlanta, where at the time, the warden was a former KKK member who wasn't having any bribes. So he was absolutely thrilled to make prison life miserable for these Italian gangsters from Chicago. It's basically a living hell for these guys. So back in Chicago, Murray Humphrey starts throwing around a lot of money and gets them transferred to Leavenworth. And eventually they all get early parole after four years. So now in the early 50s, Roselli goes to Las Vegas to see his old friend, Tony Cornero, who at the time was building the Stardust. And around this time, San Giancana is running things for Chicago. Now, Tony Cornero dies just days after his visit with Roselli, but not before telling him that the Stardust was about half finished and running out of funds. So Sam takes that info back to Chicago and that's how the outfit moves in on the Stardust. They pay off its debts, and it's the first official big Vegas casino they were majority owners of. That deal cemented Roselli and Giancana's relationship, and I mean, it really helped Sam out as well with the outfit, bringing in this huge successful investment for them. Okay, so a U.S. senator out of Arizona named Barry Goldwater was a rising star at the time. This guy attacked liberals who cited on gambling houses and prostitution and other vice crimes, but personally, he loved going to Vegas for a long weekend and having Gus Greenbaum roll out the red carpet for him. So in 1955, the outfit convinces Gus Greenbaum to come out of retirement and run the Stardust. And Gus has got some important positions to be filled. So Goldwater tells Greenbaum of his friend and political ally, Bill Nelson. And Greenbaum hires him, but it turns out Bill Nelson is actually Willie Bioff, former pimp, extortionist, and mob rat. Bioff was extremely arrogant and thought no one was gonna touch him. But on November 4th, 1955, Eight sticks of dynamite tore Willie and his car to pieces. Okay, so now in 1957, Roselli is helping to run the Tropicana with Frank Costello, Meyer Lansky, and Carlos Marcello, all as silent partners. And we all know Gigante shoots at and misses Costello, but the feds find a piece of paper in Costello's pocket with Vegas casino earnings on it. And after the Appalachian meeting in 1957, the feds are about to put the mob on blast. 
They followed everyone and anyone who was important, and they started illegally bugging everyone. I mean, the feds who tailed and dove into Roselli's past found that practically everyone had great things to say about Johnny Roselli, the gentleman gangster. And it's around this time, a huge motion picture was coming to Vegas to film a little movie called Ocean's Eleven, starring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr. So this inspired Sands Casino Hotel manager to entice the three men to appear at his hotel every night after filming, which at the time was called The Summit at the Sand, and would go on to be known as the birthplace of the Rat Pack. People like Marilyn Monroe, a young senator from Massachusetts named John Kennedy, Sam Giancana, and a young woman who was said to be extremely beautiful and extremely easy named Judith Exner were all there. Now, in 1959, Joe Kennedy sets out on a mission. He wants his golden boy, World War II hero, Massachusetts Senator's son, John Kennedy, to be the next president of the United States. He starts telling guys like Roselli and Sinatra to start telling the boys in Chicago JFK would be a great president for them. Now, Joe Kennedy is no pushover. He attacks with the mob and he attacks with the unions. Now, he does have an issue. This is right after the Kefauver hearings and his other son, Robert, was chief counsel on that. And he went after these guys like crazy. I mean, he was going for their throats. He was personally threatening and humiliating these guys. He was making up insane accusations about them to the press. I mean, Joe's got a real problem here. And he asks Frank Costello, Sam Giancana, Johnny Roselli, and an attorney named Mario Brode, who was representing Jimmy Hoffa, to meet him at a plush restaurant on Park Avenue in New York City. Now, Costello does not attend this, but everyone else does. And at this meeting, Sam brings up what a fucking dick Robert is. And Joe, being the cunning man, cunning man he is, completely agrees. He tells Sam, look, I don't know why he's such a tight ass prick, but he's been a problem in my life since he was born. He says to Sam, you think you don't like him? He says, I'm his fucking father and I fucking despise him. And then he says, but Bobby isn't running for president. John is. Get John in office. You don't have to worry about Bobby. Now, Sam had seen John around in Vegas and knew he was a ladies man. And he liked that about John. Now, one thing Joe isn't going to do is beg. He lays it out to them. You get him to be president, you'll have a friend in the White House. And on that note, he leaves the dinner early. Now, one person who is all in on Kennedy being president is Frank Sinatra. He's basically hanging on John's dick and does everything he can to convince anyone who would listen that Kennedy should be president. So... Sam takes this all back to Chicago and they vote and everyone but Murray Humphreys votes in favor of JFK. And on the campaign trail, Sam and John are now sharing a mistress in Judith Exner, which Sam just loves the fact that him and the soon to be president are fucking the same broad. So now in September of 1960, an ex-FBI agent named Bob Mayhew has become a CIA asset, and the CIA knows about the mob losing millions from their casino investments in Cuba. The CIA bets that the mob would want Cuba to go back to how it was before Castro. So under the guise of an quote-unquote angry corporation, Mayhew approaches Roselli and plants the idea of getting rid of Castro. Now, from the start, Roselli felt this was a government operation and always thought it was absolutely insane. But if the government wanted to give Roselli money and fly him around the country, he was going to take it. He tells Mayhew, I know you're not who you say you are, but I'll do it only if you assure me you are working for the government. But he wants to meet Mayhew's boss. So Mayhew arranges for Roselli to meet his boss, Jim O'Connell. Roselli tells O'Connell, I know you're not an angry corporation, but out of a sense of patriotism, 
I want to help you. Now look, that's exactly why the CIA picked Roselli to be the one they approached. This guy joined the army at age 36 to help the war effort. So Roselli introduces Mayhew to Sam Giancana and Santo Traficante Jr. And Santo tells Mayhew, I have the perfect guy, but it's going to be eh, 20, 30 grand. And he gets it. The CIA gives them money, they give them poison pills, and the mob knows this is not going to happen. And what Roselli really wanted from the CIA was protection from the FBI. Now, all these assassination attempts subside in April of 61 due to the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, back in LA in 63, Frank Sinatra sponsors Roselli for membership at the Friars Club. And it doesn't take long for Roselli to realize there's an elaborate card cheating operation being run by Maury Friedman, an old friend out of Vegas. Roselli pulls Friedman aside one day and simply says, how does it work? Friedman knows exactly who Roselli is and knows LA is his turf. Now, lying to Roselli would be the worst thing he could do. So he explains they got a peephole in the vent and all sorts of electronics and hand and card signs that make up this scam. And eventually, on July 20th, 1967, a tip came in from an enemy of Maury Friedman's named Belden Cattleman, a fellow card cheat being looked at for tax evasion. Roselli at this time goes to Jimmy Fratiano and told him if he could get rid of this witness, this problem would go away. He gives Jimmy an envelope full of cash, and Jimmy grabbed fellow L.A. crime family veteran and hitman Frank Bompensero. They drive out to Vegas to kill the witness, and right as they are sitting in this man's apartment complex, in come the feds and take him into hiding till the trial. Jimmy calls Roselli to tell him of the bad news, and as it turned out, at that time, Frank had begun cooperating with the FBI and tipped them off. So Roselli goes to trial and loses and goes back to prison. And at this time, Giancana had been so high profile, he's told by Accardo to get the fuck out of Chicago. Sam was one of Rika's protégés, and Accardo disliked Giancana more and more over the years. So as Rika is retiring, Accardo replaces Sam with Joey Ayupa, a perfect puppet front boss for Accardo to run the family behind. And just as Sam was Rika's guy, Roselli was Sam's guy. Accardo sends for Roselli after he's indicted for the Friars case, and Accardo tells Roselli he's finished in Vegas. One of the things the judge tells Roselli to do before he goes to prison is visit his dying mother he had not seen since he was 13 years old. Through years of digging, the feds finally found out Roselli's real name and had the INS try to deport him. So he gets out of prison on the Friars case and asks his parole officer if he can move to Florida and live with his sister he had recently reconnected with before he went to prison. And surprisingly, the parole officer said yes. Now, out of respect and having met Santo Traficante Jr. over the years and having always maintained a decent relationship with him, Roselli decides to check in with Santo and let him know he's living in Florida. By now, it's the mid-70s, and Roselli is being called before the church committee in regards to Operation Mongoose, the CIA's attempt to get the mob to kill Castro. Now, whether or not Traficante sent for Roselli or he went willingly, he met with Santo several times in the year or two he lived in Florida with his sister. Santo graciously hosted Roselli and his sister at his house, and Roselli's sister had nothing but wonderful things to say about Santo. Was Santo just getting Roselli to drop his guard? I'm going to say yes. Roselli disappears at the end of July in 76, having gone to Santo's house for dinner with his sister and her husband just a week earlier. His body had been found in a 55-gallon oil drum, having had his legs chopped off. Who killed Johnny Roselli and why? Well, Obviously, I don't know who or why exactly, but I would bet Detroit boss Joe Zarilli and Chicago top boss Tony Accardo had a meeting with Santo 
and either asked Santo to have one of his men carry it out or Santo just offered to have one of his men carry it out. You see, for a long time, the feds knew Johnny had been around tons of people and they wanted him to flip. So they scheduled to have Joe Zarilli come into a grand jury hearing as Roselli was leaving one day in D.C., which is a fucked up thing the feds do to try to get someone to rat or at least to get them to look like they're ratting, you know, to their associates. And, um, you know, Johnny had talked uh, Detroit into investing in one of the casinos. And, you know, when all the casinos went down in Vegas, the Detroit bosses, they blamed Johnny Roselli and the feds knew that. So the feds scheduling that, I think that that really sealed Roselli's fate. And it just took one call to Chicago and then one call to Florida to get Johnny Roselli killed. And also, he was talking during these Senate select hearings. He was not taking the fifth. Um, you know, he did try to um, tailor his testimony with his lawyer to not implicate anyone, but he was talking. And I'm sure that the combination of all those things and why take the chance? That's the mob's biggest thing ever. Why take the chance? If they even think someone's ratting, you're gone. All right, and that's it, guys. I really hope you like this video because I personally had a blast researching um, this, this topic, this man, this enigma, this gentleman gangster, Johnny Roselli. I don't think I'll make another video. I run a horror movie, silly channel, and I thought I'd just throw us out on there. There's tons of greats in this genre, like Jeff Nadeau, The Goat, uh, Scott Bernstein, and Jimmy, The Doctor, two phenomenal guys, obviously OC Shorts. Um, those are my three favorite. If you want other mob stuff, go check those guys out. They got the best stuff.